The Tom Woods Show, episode 1913. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, Tom Woods here. Thomas Jefferson Week continues on The Tom Woods Show. Again, we're not talking necessarily exclusively about Thomas Jefferson, but we're certainly talking about ideas we associate with him and the evolution of those ideas and looking at the world through a Jeffersonian lens. And that's what Brian McClanahan does in his podcast, The Brian McClanahan Show, and in his scholarly and popular work. So we're going to get into a whole bunch of topics today, including maybe trying to figure out who some of the least bad presidents were. So we'll have some fun today. Brian, welcome back. Thanks for having me, Tom. Appreciate it. All right. I'm so glad to be talking about your book, The Jeffersonian Tradition, again. I'm just picking out things that I think will be of general interest and that I find interesting as well. So let's pick out a couple more. And and right now we're still in part one of your book. You have three parts here. We're in part one. So let's talk about the supremacy clause, okay, if we may, and tell people what it is, roughly what the words are, and then how it's been misused. Because I wrote something on this for, or actually, no, no, I haven't. I've talked about, maybe, no, in nullification, I wrote a little something, but I knew somewhere I'd written about it. And you can find, you can even find Alexander Hamilton disagreeing with the current interpretation of the supremacy clause, but apparently nobody cares. So what is it? Well, the supremacy clause, of course, is it's, it's the most misused part of the Constitution. Maybe, well, I say that. Necessary and proper clause is right up there. With I was going to say, there's a the, lot of competition or, for or, that. Yeah. Or, the, or the good, as uh, as John Conyers called it, the good and welfare clause. I mean, you can't even make oh, this up. It doesn't know good, what it is. I remember that, yeah. The good and welfare clause. Well, the supremacy clause says that all laws and treaties made by the United States in pursuance of the Constitution are supreme and a supreme law of the land. I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but that part in pursuance thereof is the most important part of the entire clause. And therefore and it's, it's ignored. That's the part that's ignored. <laughs> right, you look at how it's cited. They put an ellipsis right there. All laws and treaties made in the United States are supreme law of the land, <laughs> right? So they take that part out because it is the most important part. And this is how Hamilton actually argued for it. Well, you can only make laws that are in pursuance of the Constitution. If it's not made in pursuance of the Constitution, well, it's null and void. It's not really a law, is it? And this is how we have all the laws interpreted now. We we don't even ask, are these things constitutional anymore? I remember when Nancy Pelosi was asked point blank, is Obamacare constitutional? Well, of course it's constitutional. How are you asking me this? I mean, we made the law, didn't we? Of course, of course it's constitutional. And so, you know, you bring up your book, Nullification, and if the central authority is going to have complete and utter control of its own powers and referee, final referee of its own powers, well, how do you determine if something is constitutional or not that you'll say it is? Well, you have to go back. It was argued over and over during the ratification period. Well, we have to look at these. If it's not made pursuance of the document, then it's it's not constitutional. We don't have to follow it. That's simply nullification. I mean, they, they talked about it. I find it so funny that that part of it, as you said, is the thing that's left out. And I remember you had a debate with, um, I can't remember who it was, but you were on with a law professor and he called it lawlessness. Nullification is lawlessness. Well, what is more lawlessness than passing laws that aren't really part of the constitution? That's lawlessness. I mean, there's, there's nothing other than, than that in terms of a definition of lawlessness. So the supremacy clause is misused, it's misunderstood, it's misinterpreted. The founding generation clearly identified that if the law wasn't made pursuant to the Constitution, it's no law and we shouldn't follow it. And I think that's the, the greatest tragedy of the entire interpretive process that we just forget about that part. I want to talk for a minute about the alleged divergence between large states and small states at the Philadelphia Convention of 1787, because I'm convinced that mainstream U.S. historians consider it their duty to boreify American history as much as they can, make it as dull as they could possibly make it so as not to give us any ideas. So, for example, nullification, when it has to be mentioned, it's mentioned, you know, they somehow try to connect it to slavery and then they just leave it at that. You can find people talking about nullification, North and South, for generations after the uh, ratification of the Constitution, and none of that story gets told. When we hear about the American War for Independence, that's about no taxation without representation. I practically fall asleep while saying those words. No taxation without representation is an incredibly boring principle to fight for. The whole thing was more about no legislation without representation. How about that? How about... 
we get to make our own decisions, not just on taxes, which is a kind of a, you know, not that exciting thing. Who, who gets to decide whether you get taxes taken out of you, this guy or that guy? It's just, you know, I'm not going out fighting over that probably. But the idea of my entire way of life is to be determined by decisions made here at home. And that the tradition that we've been observing for a century and a half has said that we make those decisions and we, our fate and our destiny are in our own hands. Like that's what it's about. Now, that's interesting. That's inspiring. We don't get any of that. And then at the Philadelphia Convention, well, we, you know, we don't want people to think about federalism all that much. We want them to think they're in a regime where it's legitimate for the central authority to more or less have plenary power to do what it wants. So they make the convention about this boring, well, then the the small states were afraid that the big states would, and uh, so can you describe what the actual fight was about in the convention? Sure. I mean, I think from, the, for, well, let me say something about nullification. Nullification was actually used before the American War for Independence. That was a Stamp Act. I mean, they were nullifying the Stamp Act. So this is as old as, you know, America itself, this idea you can just nullify things. If the law is unconstitutional, it's no law. I mean, the founding generation certainly agree with this. But as far as the Philadelphia Convention, the real battle there was not between large states and small states. There was, there was some of that. But it really was between nationalists and federalists. When Madison presents the Virginia plan, or at least writes it and then it's presented, the idea was to create a national government. And that's what people were afraid of. Oh my gosh, wait a second here. We don't have a national government. And the opposition immediately arose, not because it was small state, large state, but they didn't want a central authority. They, they didn't want something like they just had in Great Britain that could just do whatever they wanted. They wanted the states to have some control of this government. And you even had people from large states that thought this way. It wasn't just all small states that said, we, we want to have some control, state control of the government. No, no, there were people from large states that said the same thing. You had people from Virginia, you had people from New York that said, you know, we want a federal government. In fact, Hamilton was one of three delegates from New York, and he was outvoted by the other two all the time. That's why he packed up his bags and went home for a while and came back later. He wasn't going to get anywhere. He made his very famous speech in June of 1787, where he calls for a president for life and senators for, you know, elected monarchy, essentially. And he said, look, we're going to get this eventually. Why don't we just go for it now? But he was outvoted because that was centralizing power. And the other two delegates from New York weren't going, Lansing and Yates weren't going to go along with that. They just didn't think that was something that was important or really reflective of American society. So this idea that somehow we have a centralized authority was completely washed away in Philadelphia. In fact, one of my favorite speeches is by Governor, I often call him Governor because that's how it's, but Governor Morris. Governor Morris stands up and says, look, if we have incompatible things right now, let's just separate. We don't need to be here together if really, if this is the case, we're all talking about these things, if this is just true, let's just break the union up right now. Because if we don't, it's going to happen eventually. But let's do it right now. But if not, let's try to get together and work this thing out. But he also made a clear distinction between a federal republic and a national government. He said, look, a national government is compulsory. You have to do it. And a federal republic is not. And he essentially sided with the idea what we were doing is getting a federal republic. So and Morris was a nationalist. I mean, he he wasn't one who was necessarily in favor of this idea, but he said, this is what we have. This is what we're working with, et cetera, et cetera. So you have this nationalist versus federalist. The real federalists were now called the anti-federalists. But what they wanted was to maintain the federal structure as under the Articles of Confederation. The states had complete control over their domestic concerns. They would delegate some authority to the center because they thought, well, it'd be a good idea to have common defense, maybe to have a, a free trade zone between the states, and we can have a unified voice when it comes to international trade. But that was it. And if you look at the imperial structure that they seceded from, that's essentially what they were arguing in 1776, that the British were violating that. They even conceded, well, you can defend us, you can, you can regulate our international trade, but you cannot tell us we have to get rid of our currency here. You cannot tell us we have to uh, pay this tax that we didn't vote for. You can't say you can shut down our legislature. That's illegal. You can't do these things. So I think that's where you have this, this break. It's not in, in this misunderstanding of what was happening. It was a constitutional crisis in 1776. It was a constitutional crisis in 1787 as to what kind of government we were going to have, national or federal. And the federal government, the idea of a confederated republic or a federal republic wins. It doesn't lose. The nationalists actually lose in Philadelphia. 
and they lose in ratification. But of course, that's all ignored once we get the government and 1789, the central authority. Let's talk about neoconservatives. And there's some overlap between them and Straussians, but I don't want to get into the weeds on that. In general, well, not in general, I would say in every single instance, I don't know of an exception. Neocons have a particular view of the U.S. that is, as you say, Lincolnian. So they, they look at the, the nature of the U.S. exactly the same way that Joe Biden does. No difference. They view it as a single indivisible whole in which there's no part that enjoys any pre-existing liberties that can't just be arbitrarily withdrawn, canceled, restricted by the center. They would think of that as having two sovereigns, the center and the state. So that's as much as they, as far as their analysis goes. So the sovereign voice comes from the center and we just have to obey orders. And maybe some neocons will say some of the orders are not right, but in that case, you just sit and wait for the Supreme Court to put things right. Um, Comments? I mean, well, I think you're correct. Uh, I would say this about Joe Biden, though. Look, I grew up in Delaware, so I've been around Joe Biden a long time. And Biden is, what he's doing now, and look, Biden is just a political opportunity. He doesn't really care what the position is. Whatever the Democrat Party says, that's what he's going to do. And whatever they say that he needs to do, he just wanted to be president. <laughs> that's it. Joe Biden is one of those guys that he didn't really care how he got it. He just wanted it. He's he's that power hungry. And I think that's what defines Joe Biden's political career. Early in his political career, he wasn't necessarily in favor of extreme centralization on everything. I mean, he was he was kind of a, you know, he, he would agree with some decentralist ideas when it came to uh, the state powers over some concerns. You know, for example, uh, when you look at civil rights issues, he certainly was in line with some other Southern Democrats at times with what he thought about some some civil rights issues. But Biden now is complete centralist and the idea of the proposition nation. But when you talk about the new, I think you got it exactly right. The neoconservatives believe in this Lincolnian nationalism. And it's not just that, it's Lincolnian internationalism. That's that's the other part of of, uh, Lincolnianism that uh, becomes very dangerous, is this idea that we have to spread liberty and democracy around the globe, and you have to take our liberty and democracy or die. And and this this is what we see in the Middle East. This is what we see in Asia. This is what we've seen in Europe. We've seen it all over. I mean, this is Wilson creating these nation states like Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia, which weren't going to work because they didn't recognize political culture. It's after World War One dividing up uh, these Middle Eastern states into strongman controlled states like Iraq and Iran. And the idea was to break up the Ottoman Empire. But then these people need to be eventually democratic. And uh, so you're going to be democratic, even if the political culture doesn't reflect that of the, of the place. Maybe they don't have a political culture that can accept Western-style democracy, but we want them to have it, and they have to have it. So the the neoconservatives are dangerous in that they want to have this one-size-fits-all government. As you said, well, if it's bad, we'll just let the Supreme Court decide, and if it doesn't decide in the way we want, well, we just got to live with it. That's not the American tradition. That's not what Jeffersonian said. I mean, this is why I call it the Jeffersonian tradition. Jefferson said with the Supreme Court, well, I mean, this is just an opinion of a man. And it's not just because he made it doesn't mean it's right. Uh, so this is where the states would come into play in that. And so the political culture of these states would, would reflect that. So the neoconservatives are, um, and again, you said there's there's a difference between the Straussians and the neoconservatives. You can't have the neoconservatives in many ways without Strauss. And I know that you know Paul Gottfried and I and I have talked about this. And you know he says, well, I mean, the neoconservatives would have existed without Strauss, but they certainly gave their intellectual side of it a little stronger position. But the Straussians, there's other Straussians besides neoconservatives, but I think that the neoconservatives are the most dangerous element in America because they simply they simply go along with where the left is doing in certain ways, and then they have this very aggressive foreign policy, which I think Ron Paul has correctly said that you can't look at domestic policy without foreign policy. They, they, they mirror each other, and that's where the danger of, of Lincolnian nationalism comes in. Hey, everybody. Normal life seems to be resuming across the country. And of course, summer is just about here. So we have all kinds of pleasant distractions and diversions in our lives. But Old Woods here wants to remind his younger listeners than he is of an extremely important aspect of being an adult, and that is providing for people who depend on you. If somebody in your life relies on your financial support, whether we're talking about a child or an aging parent or even a business partner, you need life insurance. Policy Genius makes it easy to compare quotes from over a dozen top insurers all in one place. Now, why would you want to compare? 
you could save $1,300 or more per year on life insurance by using Policy Genius to compare policies. And getting started is easy. You just go to policygenius.com, working out how much life insurance you need, and looking at quotes to get your best price. And as soon as you're ready to apply, the Policy Genius team handles the paperwork and scheduling for free. They never sell your information to other companies, and they don't add on extra fees. So head to policygenius.com to get started right now. Policy Genius, when it comes to insurance, it's nice to get it right. Let's move ahead to some discussions that you have in here about U.S. presidents. Now, obviously, you've written a book on U.S. presidents and the really bad ones and a few decent ones. Before we get into your list, what is your opinion of James Polk and, in particular, the way the the Mexican War came about. What do you think about that? Well, you know, that's a fun story because when I was an undergraduate, I loved James K. Polk. You know, and we've talked about this before. You know, when you're an undergraduate, you just, you don't want to kick everybody's butt. It's great. U.S. military is fun. And you just, I mean, we both went through this, right? Well, yeah, we're rah, rah, America. And, and it's very, it's, it's intoxicating in so many ways. And I love James K. Polk because I wrote two papers on Polk as an undergraduate that my professors hated because I was so pro-Polk. But then uh, as I matured, and <laughs> I started looking at Polk and, and the understanding the Constitution and other things. Polk was a disaster for the Constitution because of the way he involved the United States in the war with Mexico. In fact, you could say that it was illegal. I mean, he sends Zachary Taylor into a disputed region. And then as the Mexican army shoots at Zachary Taylor and kills a few, well, American blood has been shed on American soil. Well, what American soil? I mean, this was disputed. The Mexicans said that was their territory. We're saying it's our territory. The actual evidence is more in favor of Mexico than the United States. So he involves the United States in this war through executive action. And John C. Calhoun pointed this out. He said, this is a dangerous war because what we're doing is creating an imperial presidency by this. And so Polk was a disaster in terms of foreign policy. He's often considered to be a great president because he had this agenda. We're going to do X, Y, Z. And uh, or, you know, we're going to get these things done. And he supposedly got all of them done, though not necessarily the way that he wanted them. In that way, he's often seen as a success. And the neoconservatives love James K. Polk. And even some on the left love James K. Polk because he was, you know, this active president. I would say he's a he's a constitutional disaster. I certainly agree that lowering the tariff was a good idea at the time. And Polk was certainly better on domestic policy than some other presidents in terms of adhering to the Constitution. But when it comes to foreign policy, he was a real disaster. And of course, he's setting the United States up by acquiring California, which was always his goal. Norman Grabner wrote a really good book about that empire on the Pacific back in the 1950s. And it's been I mean, persuasive since then. But Polk's real goal was California. And by getting California, we and he was told, if you do this, you're going to involve the United States in Pacific Wars. And what has happened? I mean, we've had since that time, how many Pacific Wars have we been involved in because of American expansion into the Pacific Rim? So in my opinion, Polk was a, a bad president overall just because of that. All right. The reason I bring that up actually is that we just had a, well, on the day that you and I are recording this, the, the other night we had a surprise graduation party for my daughter, Regina, just graduated from high school. And during the dinner, the subject of Polk came up. I assure you I did not bring up Polk at a graduation dinner. I was trying to be on good behavior and normal, talk about normal things. She brought it up and wanted my opinion. Oh, and then I thought, well, you know, I, I'm pretty sure I know what Brian's opinion probably is, but let me go ahead and ask him. So that question is officially inspired by Regina. So let's go. I, you've talked about John Tyler before and why you think he was a great president. Maybe take 30 seconds on John Tyler and then give me, Give me like a lightning round of your five that you think are, you know, worth defending. Okay. Well, John Tyler certainly is worth defending. In fact, I would say John Tyler is the best president in American history, at least under the Constitution, as ratified. That's because Tyler was doing what he was supposed to do as president. Tyler vetoed bills that were completely unconstitutional, whether it was a recharting of a, of a bank. They wanted the third bank of the United States. We didn't get it, thank goodness, at that time. Tyler was vetoing internal improvements bills. Tyler was doing things that uh, the president should do. If the bill was unconstitutional, you veto it. And he was so infuriating to the Whig party, they expelled him from the party, had a big conference on the Capitol steps and said, John Tyler is no longer in our party. I mean, that is a ringing endorsement of John Tyler, if there is one, right? So Tyler looked, Tyler was a Jeffersonian. 
he was the one individual who cast a vote against the force bill when he was in the Senate, made a speech against it. He was told this is political suicide. Don't do it. And he said, I don't care. I'm going to make a speech against it anyways, and I'm going to say it's unconstitutional. And it was, right? So John Totter was always this very Jeffersonian, he in fact, supped with Thomas Jefferson. His father was good friends with Jefferson. So he understood this Jeffersonian tradition. Totter also was, of course, instrumental in acquiring Texas, which uh, some people said is unconstitutional where they did it. I don't agree. I mean, the Congress can admit new states, and they did through a, through a joint resolution. They admitted the state of Texas into the union. So it didn't require a treaty. They could just do it. But when you look at how Tyler viewed the government, viewed the powers of the executive, and he had this very famous confrontation with, uh, with Henry Clay, and he basically told Henry Clay, look, we were born in the same place. Clay was born in Virginia. We breathe the same air, but we differ on these things. You go back to the Capitol and you do your job, and I'll stay here and do my job. And they never really spoke to each other again. And I think that's, that's one of the, again, another ringing endorsement of John Tyler a man who was willing to have principle above party and do the right thing. If it was vetoing a bank, if it was vetoing internal improvements, he was doing the right things as president and using the veto power the way it was intended. And that was a check on unconstitutional legislation. Now, as far as my other favorite presidents, I mean, look, even though Washington did some things that I would find to be problematic, particularly under the influence of Hamilton, I still think Washington is one of the greatest men but also greatest presidents in American history. You don't have the executive branch in any type of restraint without Washington. I mean, he certainly was in favor of restraint. So I think George Washington was a great president. I think that Thomas Jefferson, particularly the first term, was a great president. The second term, not so much, but the first term, he was certainly trying to do some things that would make the presidency more in line with what the founding generation thought it should be and not an elected monarch. Moving forward from there, I would say that Grover Cleveland is one of the best. I mean, Grover Cleveland is uh, used the veto again like John Tyler did as a hammer against unconstitutional legislation. And what he was vetoing more than anything else there were these fraudulent pension bills that were coming out of the Congress for Civil War veterans. You know, a guy that fell off a ladder 20 years after the war is over wants a pension because he hurt himself doing that. He said, this is, this is complete fraud. It's waste. You can't do that. So he was vetoing all these pension bills. He also vetoed other bills that were unconstitutional, like the Texas seed bill, which, of course, the left excoriates him for. Calvin Coolidge, very good. Calvin Coolidge is, uh, is certainly one of the best. Uh, the pieces in the book, though, that, that you're talking about, I talk about underrated presidents. And I put a couple in there that I think are just fun, like Franklin Pierce and, uh, and James Buchanan, Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson just irritates everybody if I talk about Andrew Johnson. But if you look at what Andrew Johnson was doing at the time, he certainly was in line with Lincoln's view on what Reconstruction should be. He was vetoing bad legislation, and, he, and it was I mean, unconstitutional legislation. And so that's something we should say, well, at least the guy's vetoing unconstitutional legislation. Same thing with Pierce and Buchanan. I mean, these were, these were not bad presidents under the Constitution. They're just bad presidents because they weren't activists like we think a president should be today. And if you look at polls, there was a poll that somebody sent me recently about presidents. And, you know, John Tyler's at the end and all these presidents I just talked about. One of the questions was, how much do you know about these people or how familiar with you? And it was like 70% had never even heard of these people before, but yet they're rated terrible because they don't know who they are. So the only good presidents are presidents that did all kinds of unconstitutional things. And the only bad presidents are presidents that actually follow the Constitution. I mean, think about how we flip the entire script on its head in, that, in the way we rank presidents. And that's exactly what happens on a regular basis. Yeah, every once in a while. Now, I haven't seen one in a while, but maybe that's because I haven't been looking. Somebody comes up, releases a list of the presidents ranked by historians. And this is a completely pointless exercise. You know, you might have experts, let's say on American sports, rank the greatest boxers of all time. There's some plausibility there. You know, there are objective criteria you can use to decide who's the best boxer. But who's the best president depends on what you think a good president is. It's It's entirely a value judgment. If you think the role of the president is the humble execution of the laws, well, you're going to have a completely different list. So the list, I know this sounds like a cliche, but it it couldn't be more true here. The list tells us far more about the historians themselves than it does about the presidents. How could it be otherwise? You're absolutely right. And if you go on, you look at social media, and it's funny sometimes, you have these uh, professors in various departments, and they'll make statements on things. And then you look at what their specialty is. And it's like, you know, 19th century 
women's uh, rights literature, and then they're commenting on you know something else that has that's completely out of their field, right? And so, but they're experts, and this is what we do. We just okay, here you're a U.S. historian, rank the presidents. Well, most of these people don't even know who these people are. I mean, they they don't. I'll give you another example. John Hansen, who was um, often called the first president of the United States because he was the president under the Articles of Confederation of the Congress. And so, you know, John Hansen, I was reading an article about John Hansen, and there was a professor at the University of Maryland, and she specialized in American colonial and early federal history. She didn't even know who John Hansen was, and she's in Maryland, right? He's from Maryland. She doesn't know who the guy is. Oh, I had no idea who John Hansen was. I guess he's pretty important. She's teaching at the University of Maryland. What does this say about the historical profession? These people don't even know what they're talking about 99% of the time when it comes to the presidents or the Constitution, how we should uh, look at the powers of the presidency. This is why when I wrote Nine Presidents Who Screwed Up America, I said at the beginning, I'm ranking the presidents based on how they adhered to their oath of office, which was you know, defending the Constitution, uphold defending the Constitution of the United States. And, and that's the only way we should rank them. If they violated the, their oath, then they shouldn't be a good president. And so Abraham Lincoln shouldn't be a good president. You know, Franklin Roosevelt shouldn't be a good president. Harry Truman shouldn't be a good president. Donald Trump or Barack Obama or Joe Biden shouldn't be good presidents because they violate the oath of office continually. Well, the Lincoln thing, you know, given the time we have and, and we're going to wrap up today and the scope and stuff we're covering in this book, I'm going to refer people to other episodes of the show because that's a, that's an episode unto itself, because that will scandalize some of my newer listeners. They just can't understand. What, you don't want to abolish slavery? I mean, but the thing is, I want you to think, think about the COVID thing that you probably started following me for. There are people who say, oh, what, you just want your grandmother to die? And like, you knew it wasn't that simple. And you knew you didn't want your grandmother to die. And you knew your opposition couldn't be reduced to one bumper sticker slogan. But yet that's what everyone around you did. So we're not going to do that to people who have dissident historical views either. We're going to hear them out the same way we wanted to be heard out on the uh, on the COVID thing. But this episode ain't that. I'll put some uh, episodes on that subject on the show notes page, and that's tomwoods.com slash 1913, where you can also find linked Brian's most recent book, The Jeffersonian Tradition. Brian, thanks a lot. We'll do one more tomorrow. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. All right, folks, just a reminder, in case you haven't checked it out yet, you got to check this thing out. I compiled a quiz for all those people who think that all the crazy nonsense they did with us, whether who, who knows, all this stuff they imposed on us, the, the lockdowns, the stay at home, the closed dining, the plexiglass barriers, the masks, whatever the heck it was, none of it did any good. And you can see that in this quiz where you have to pick out, well, pick out which state didn't do any of this. And and it's just lines on a graph, but none of the states are identified. You have to pick out which is which, and you can't. That's pretty damning. So it's covidchartsquiz.com. COVID, charts with an S, quiz.com. Go check that out. You'll have some fun, and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.